All right. Two minutes in. Pardon my tardiness, folks. Uh, we are here. I'm Michael Tekinstro. This is the Ujima Hour, and uh, you are on live with us here. Um, please make sure that you make your comments in the chat section. Uh, shout out black culture, black cooperation, black power, black communities, black strategies. Um, this is the Ujima Hour where we are engaged in an in-depth study of cooperative strategies um, with a series of different guests throughout the week. Uh, throughout the throughout the month, uh, throughout the year, um, we've been going uh, here since um, November of last year, um, engaged in in a, some dialogues with some very um, some brilliant folks, you know, some some magnificent people. Um, Renee Hatcher of the Business Enterprise um, Law Clinic at John Marshall Law School, uh, now the Community Enterprise and Solidarity Economy Clinic. Um, Dr. Stacy Sutton of the Center for Urban Policy, uh, Urban Planning and Policy Administration at UIC. Um, we have had uh, Christina Brown, Counterbalance ATX and 400 Plus One, uh, doing some dynamite work down there in Austin, Texas. Uh, we've had um, Dr. Kamal Rashid um, of the Association of Classical African Civilizations, uh, as well as, you know, um, an, an, an adept martial artist and uh, a member of um, the Black Survival Network uh, here in, in Chicago. We've had... Um, Danielle M. Kali of Nexus Community Partners. Um, so, you know, we, we've talked uh, a lot about the work that's happening there in Minneapolis, along with uh, the guest that night, Malaya Connolly um, of the Village Financial Cooperative. Um, so we've talked a lot about how finance is factoring in. Uh, we've had Latier Pisces of Womanist Working Collective um, talking about ways that we are thinking through um, maximizing our use of all forms of capital, maximizing our use of the, the human capital that exists in our communities, that exists in our neighborhoods. Uh, we've had on Dara Cooper of the National Black Food and uh, Justice Alliance um, talking about decolonizing our, our ways of, of thinking about land ownership and, and land access, um, as well as food apartheid. Uh, and tonight we've got uh, Jamila Medley of the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, uh, who we'll be speaking with. Um, and We'll be talking a bit about cooperative infrastructure. We'll be ta talking about the development of cooperative infrastructure, how that looks on a city and a municipal level, um, as well as how that connects to larger strategies that are happening throughout the, throughout the nation. And um, then next month, uh, we've got Dion Lucas of E.G. Wood here in, in Chicago in the Inglewood neighborhood, who it, will be talking about um, – about cooperative strategies for real estate ownership and how that looks in terms of bringing groups of entrepreneurs together to cooperatively own real estate um, as a part of a, of a community development strategy, as a part for the revitalization of the commercial corridor of a community, uh, bringing those entrepreneurs together. So we, we've got a dynamite lineup. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so delighted. I'm so glad to um, have these conversations in the public way, in the public forum, because these are conversations that I myself have been having um, in the background you know, um, um, in the side and at conferences, um, at various places. And I wanted to make sure that these things were accessible in a public forum because I was interested, I was curious, right? So I'm following a personal curiosity here. I was curious about the ways that we are thinking about um, connecting these, uh, the, the, the sort of resistance-based social movements that we have developed um, to to, to new economic strategies, prefigurative and future economic strategies, and, and looking at cooperatives as the way we think about how our future economies look. So if we're talking about more just societies, we're not simply talking about that from a legal basis. We're not simply talking about that from the political uh, strategies that we're using, but we're talking about actually developing uh, new ideas around um, around how we envision the economy, uh, how we envision society. But again, you know, these, these are not necessarily new ideas. One thing that um, Dr. Kamal Rashid talked to us about in that, in that discussion we had with him was that we're not dealing with new ideas. Um, when we talk about uh, the, the sort of black liberatory strategies that we employed um, as, as folks uh, came out of enslavement, came out of bondage here in this, in this nation or on these shores or in, in the North America context or, or in, in other contexts, um, they did not necessarily come out and decide that they were going to build the exact same society they came out of. They came out of that context and they came out of bondage and they decided that they were going to build a different type of society, a different type of justice in the societies that they, that they developed. And so um, in that context, we're talking about maroon economies and fugitive economies of the past. We're talking about values that we have from the past that we can draw upon. 
even as we're talking about this notion of this new economy, even as we're talking about a solidarity economy, these are not things that are new to marginalized communities, and, and, and in specific, to black communities. These are not things that are, that are new to us. These are values that we, we had to draw upon, right? So when you're talking about uh, folks who are marginalized um, from the, the general norm, norms of society, when you're talking about communities that have to exist outside, uh, oftentimes, of the law, outside of the political structure, then what you're talking about is you're developing um, some economic norms, some sense of cooperation, some sense of relationship that's vastly different from folks who have the protection of the law, who have the protection of the political structure, who have access to the formal economy. Um, you're developing a different sense of relationship um, that, that, that we need, to, we need to actually analyze more deeply and, you know, hope, and uh, later on in the year, um, at the end of the year, we're going to be talking to Richard Wallace about, about his work in informal economies, and ideally we'll get to some of that discussion there as well. But when we talk about these informal economies that exist in our community, um, they, they exist for purpose, right? They exist for, for, for basic subsistence, but they are something that we can learn about the types of relationships that happen inside of those economies some for good, you know, some for some not, right? You know, so there's there's ways to make sure that we're we're only pulling, we're only harvesting the best elements and the best aspects of that informal economy and those informal economies, but we need to study them. We need to understand them because the exact same concepts that exist in this notion of the new economy, this 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 notion of the solidarity economy are principles that our communities have engaged for a very long time. And so with that um, I, I just jump right into subject matter this evening, and I didn't even get to get uh, get clear on the intro. So, um, first of all, I clarified this uh, with our guest um, a moment ago, but I'll also make sure that I speak it to uh, everyone here in the audience. Um, if at any point you cannot hear me, um, or you, or it's difficult to hear me, or you're having having uh, some sort of trouble in terms of the broadcast. Please make sure that you just type that in the comment section. Um, last month, uh, when we were speaking to Dara Cooper, uh, there was an unfortunate incident with my microphone that caused some clicking on the broadcast. And you know, I, I don't want any of that to go uh, wrong now. And I also want to make sure that you know this is some critical information. So. Even though Dara was coming through very clearly last time, you know, that sort of uh, back and forth conversation that's necessary for the broadcast was not happening. And I want to make sure that, you know, everything that is that needs to happen in this dialogue does happen. So uh, make sure that you are, are tuned in there in the chat section. Uh, please make sure you're posting your questions as they arise. I uh, want to make sure that we are able to get to those at the end of the broadcast. And... Um, we just want to make sure that, that all of that is accessible and available to you um, as we move forward with the Ujima Awa. All right. And so um, doing a bit of intro here, um, we are broadcasting live inside of the Bridge Embassy for Black America. Uh, so if you are not subscribed to the Biba group on Facebook, uh, please make sure that you do uh, drop in to uh, the Biba group. Uh, that's B-E-B-A. Um, that's a place where we're talking through uh, uh, cooperative strategies from a different perspective, right? So we, we're, we're talking through cooperative strategies um, as a way to think about how we are building uh, black communities, how we are protecting black communities, how we are sustaining black communities, um, and, and all of those aspects are present within Bridge. There are people that are doing amazing work there. There are conversations that are happening there that are critical, um, and please make sure that you are engaged with the, the Bridge Embassy for Black America to uh, engage with those conversations and to meet some of those uh, folks. Uh, we have lots of folks from Chicago, but there are folks all over the nation that, you know, drop into that group, uh, report back on their receipts, talk about places that are, are safe spaces for black people in, inside of their communities, inside of their cities. And um, it, it's, it's a dynamite place to make sure that you are engaged. Um, so Bridge Embassy for Black America, down there at the bottom right corner of your screen, um, or actually I think it's on the bottom left uh, on, on the broadcast, but um, – you, you, you'll, you'll find that the flag of Biba, so, you know, making sure that you are looking at those, those qualities that exist inside of Biba, that Aya Fern at the top um, and that, that Akan stool at the bottom. So we, we, uh, we are well, well, well aware of our sort of cultural capital and the, the, the heritage and the stock that we come from uh, within the Bridge Embassy for Black America. 
The other partner in this broadcast is uh, the Colonut Collaborative. The Colonut Collaborative is Chicago's very own uh, Time Bank, uh, Community Skillshare, Service Exchange, Time Exchange. Uh, it's a place where um, we are working with communities to think through uh, how, you, how we are um, doing needs assessment, how we are mapping the skills that exist inside of our communities, how we are better deploying and engaging our human capital. And it is through time banking that I come to uh, cooperative economic strategies and cooperative development, and uh, it is through uh, time banking that I, I came to really think about, um, you know, something that we talked about in this broadcast. So remember, um, during this sort of initial run of the broadcast, we talked about those four elements, that cooperation, capital, economy, autonomy, um, those four elements. So when we talk about that capital element, we're talking about those eight forms of capital, uh, financial, intellectual, living, material, cultural, experiential, social, and spiritual, uh, so those, those uh, eight forms of capital being all of the different ways that we could potentially exchange in our communities, but uh, we are, 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 are pigeonholed into that single form, that financial capital, uh, and then once we're pigeonholed into the, into the financial capital, our communities are then labeled under-resourced. Um, so, so while there is a resource drain on our community, it's not necessarily that we are under-resourced. There is extraction happening. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we have lots of resources. Those resources are being extracted from our communities, and we need to develop uh, economic strategies and deal in economic systems that relieve us from that economic extraction, that actually start to think about, uh, as, as we talked about in, uh, in um, the, the, the project that predates the Cold Net Collaborative, um, which is Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living and Healthy Food Hub, um, one of the things we always talked about there was that we are trying to get to uh, a restorative economic structure, right? And and so Black Oaks was thinking about it from the land structure. So we, we need to decolonize our relationship to the land, and we need to make sure we have a, a restorative, uh, resilient relationship to the land. And so uh, I, I simply took that same same line of thinking, and I, I wanted to make sure that I drew it into the work that I was able to do uh, with social structures, with uh, what, what was called social permaculture, and with economic structures. Uh, and so that's how we, we, we lead up to the Colonet Collaborative. Um, that's how it leads up to the work that the Colonet Collaborative is now doing with uh, cooperative development and with cooperative education. And, uh, and you know, and we're fortunate to uh, have a, have a fantastic educator with us this evening that we're going to um, be able to ask some questions of. So. Uh, make sure that you you uh, have your your ears open uh, for a spell, and that um, you can uh, go ahead and tune into that chat section and post those questions. Uh, because as we get to later in the broadcast, I want to make sure that we answer a few of those questions that you might have. Uh, and with that, uh, give me just a moment. Uh, I want to make sure that this uh, broadcast is not uh, on delay at all. All right. Uh, with that, we at the 745 mark. Um, I just want to uh, make sure that folks know um, there's a lot that's been going on within the Cold Nut Collaborative. Um, so there's there's a lot of elements that um, we've been working on. Uh, I've had an opportunity to, to take a visit to uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and, and visit with Cooperation Works. Um, so those are some elements that we'll be uh, digging into inside of um, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group, and I'll tell you more about our upcoming dates um, in, at the end of the broadcast. Um, I also want to make sure that um, I highlight uh, Bridge Embassy for Black America, the Neo Green book. Um, you still need it. Uh, we still are, 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 thrive, are seeking spaces that are safe for black people. Um, I, and, and a brief story that I'll tell, uh, you know, the other side of me, so the other side of me is not, you know, an economist um, and is, is not someone who's a, a necessarily a systems thinker. The other side of me is a dancer. Um, and, you know, I, I love to go out dancing in Chicago um, and, and, and jam in the house scene. Uh, so I had an opportunity to get out dancing with a couple of friends, you know, that I, I, I engage with, um, my dancers, my DJs. Uh, we went out to a set uh, last night at a place called Bounce. Um, 
And, you know, the, the, the set was called Afro Disco. They've had about four of these sets. Um, they usually host them at a place called the State. Um, but, you know, for some reason, the DJs had relocated to Bounce. They had built some relationship or something with this venue. And uh, so we, we, we dancers, we DJs, you know, we all go over and we jam at this set called Bounce. Um, set was, you know, for, for, was a day set, you know, so it's like 4 p.m. until. Um, and, you know, later on, the until turned into about 11 p.m. But before 11 p.m. hit, at right around 8.30 p.m., um, the DJs got on the, on the horn and they said, um, I'm sorry to tell you this, folks, so uh, we got to clear the venue. There's another event that's uh, actually going to be coming in here at 9, and they got to reset the tables. Um, now, I have no idea, I have no context for whether or not the DJs had a clear contract, you know, that said we're going to be here till 11 p.m. jamming. Um, but what I do know is that um, the house scene uh, over many years in Chicago has been suffering a dearth of venues. You know, uh, we have a, a, a severe lack of venues that actually uh, operate as spaces that can safely house house right um you know that that can actually securely house house um and there was actually a panel that the um Chicago Center for Black Music Research I want to say um hosted uh, recently where where um DJs were actually were talking to that subject they were talking about the fact that you know house is without a home in the city of its birth um so to that point, um, when we talk about sort of this, this element of this Neil Green book, you know, um, one of the things that Tequila Shabazz uh, wanted to be clear on when she was developing sort of this edition of the Green book was that, hey, you know, there are lots of, uh, lots of times where, you know, uh, we are in spaces that are hostile to our, our, our cultural capital, that are hostile to the, the, the things that we bring, and um, we, we don't want to actually – have to continue we don't want to have to continue to engage that way we don't want to engage that way when it's uh when it's simply for entertainment purposes we don't want to engage that way when it's for um retail purposes as evidenced by the sort of pull out of target you know in in, in a great portion of the southeast chicago uh, communities um we don't want to engage that way um you know when 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 uh, it's our politicians right we don't want to actually have to in, engage in that way uh we need uh to have a document or, or we need have a, we need to have databases we need to have methodologies that allow us to identify places that are um, safe for us to patronize, that actually contribute to the uh, stabilization of our community wealth, and that contribute to the stabilization of our communities. Uh, so that's why we need the Neo Green Book, um, and that's why we need cooperative strategies, because we are building those places that are safe for us. With that, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest for the evening. Uh, Jamila Medley is the executive director of the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance. Um, Jamila is also a consultant with CDS Consulting Co-op, and um, Jamila Medley is also an instructor. Or was or is, is well is was an instructor for the governance portion of the Nexus Cooperative Development Fellowship uh, that I am currently engaging with in, with the Nexus Community Partners out of Minneapolis. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a great deal that I've learned from our conversations. Um, there's a great deal that I've learned from simply watching the work of the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, uh, even from afar. And then there's a great deal of work that I, a, a great deal that I've learned by asking questions about the work that I was watching, because we never get the inside story when we're watching from the outside, so it's critical that we go to the source and that we actually ask these questions. Hence, we have the Ujima Awa to uh, pose some questions to these uh, to the source. Uh, so, with that, I want to introduce Jamila Medley to the conversation. Uh, Jamila, you are on live. Hello, good evening. All right, there was a slight break in the segment. There, um, give me a moment to make sure that I bring our guests back in. Um, Pardon me.
All right, folks. Um, so while my computer is is resetting itself and I'm bringing our guests back in on Skype, um, yes, this is the Ujima Awa, and you know I am an IT consultant by day, so um, there is no technical issue that is too great for me to uh, address. Um, <laughs> with that, uh, you know I, I will be back online shortly here for um, for Jamila to, to to loop in. All right. Hello. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you are back on. And I'm just trying to switch my microphone input because I wouldn't want any sort of feedback from the computer. Um, yes. So, as I was telling our guest, <laughs> uh, I am a technician by day. And so, you know, um, there, there's no uh, technical challenge that's too great for me to recover from. All uh, right. <laughs> and that's, that's where we stand now. Uh, so... Just a moment to make sure that this loops you back in. Boom. Okay. You are back on screen. Uh, okay. And I'm just going to flip this off and flip this back on. So. All right. Can you hear me clear, Jamila? I can hear you. Okay, excellent. All right. So um, yes, we we are back to uh, the headset, and we'll 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 stay there. Um, all right. So back to the dialogue. Um, what I I wanted to go to uh, first with you was just um, for you to go ahead and give some backstory. Um, tell us how you came to this work of uh, cooperative development, or um, in in fact, just kind of walk us up the, the the space until we get to that point of the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, and then we'll dive a little deeper on that part. Sure. Um, I grew up in uh, Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm. and. Um, got to Philadelphia by way of work and um, marriage, so to speak. And after um, grad school at um, UPenn, I stumbled upon the co-op sector really while I was looking for work. Um, prior to that, I had um, been working in nonprofit organizations, doing program development and uh, managing membership programs. Um, for organizations uh, serving homeless folks, involved in um, cancer research, folks um, recovering from addiction and alcohol abuse. And when I came to um, co-ops, it was by entry uh, 
via a food co-op in West Philadelphia called Mariposa Food Co-op, where I got hired there as um, the membership coordinator initially. And I think I was, it, the thing that resonated about it for me was that I had determined that I wanted my career to be um, work that I could do that I felt was really being helpful and of service um, to other people. And the thing that kind of stu stood out for me with the cooperative model was this idea that not only could I help people, but I was really being of service to people helping themselves. And that was a very distinct experience for me than my um, prior experiences working in, in nonprofits where a lot of it was charitable and oriented around a never ending cycle of um, anticipated philanthropy to support others versus really helping and supporting people with identifying and cultivating their self-determination. Um, and that's what got me kind of really curious about the cooperative movement, about cooperative economics. And um, I've been doing it since 2012 now. Absolutely. And um, would you say that, you know, um, coming to the, the work of cooperatives helps to contextualize um, some of your other work? Um, I know that when I talk to people about uh, the, the, the history of the work with the Healthy Food Hub, there's a lot of elements that I did not necessarily um that I did not, didn't necessarily see as cooperative develop, development work, but that, you know, factor in to, to, you know, how I think about how, how folks develop relationships, how organizations operate. Um, so how does the, the work of sort of coming to this cooperative, these cooperative principles or cooperative develop, development help to help you reflect on that work before? Sure. Um, in some ways I think about the ways in reflection, I can think about the ways in which I've witnessed people practicing cooperative economics um, that I might not have had that particular language um, for it while I was observing it, either in childhood through um, my church and the ways in which the church leaders and elders and community members organized with um, communities and other churches in um, that part of Brooklyn where I was growing up to create and um, establish affordable housing through home ownership opportunities, right? And supporting um, working class and poor black people and being able to own their own homes, right? Um, or, or thinking about even in, um, you know, working in the cancer research uh, sector and seeing the underrepresentation of people of color in the sector and how people of color self-organized to get their needs met, right? So that they could have the resources and access to information and organize um, themselves to get what it was that they needed um, in order to be able to move forward their work. So there are all of these ways in which I think, you know, I can now recall seeing these practices happening. Um, and, you know, they, they might not have called, the people doing that work might not have called themselves cooperatives, but in many ways they were functioning as cooperatives um, and cooperative enterprises coming together to um, meet the needs, um, whether they were economic, cultural, or social, they were meeting um, their, their needs by combining their resources and showing up for themselves and for one another. Absolutely. And so you come to cooperatives, um, if, if I'm correct, so through Mariposa, through sort of... Um, this relationship with the food cooperative, um, a food cooperative, which is simultaneously, I, I think I would say, or perhaps you, I'll ask you this question. So both the most necessary and then the most difficult to either get off the ground and sustain, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. Um, shout out to food co-ops, uh, nationally food co-ops just wrapped up, uh, a national conference, CCMA, where hundreds of cooperators involved in the food co-op scene, um, were together. Uh, yeah, it's a very hard um, industry to break into. Grocery is is challenging anyway. It's very low margins, low profits, um, but also requires very high capital to get a grocery store up and running. Mm -hmm. So when our communities, you know, and the, the hundreds and thousands of people who come together to say we want a grocery store, we want to determine what kind of food comes into our neighborhood. We want to determine, you know, when there is profit. Um, where it's going to go, we want control of that. And we want to determine when um, it's time to give to, to, to expand or it's time to give it quits. We don't want other people quitting on us. We want control over that. Um, and so I think the folks who are organizing to do that work um, have a particular 
um, oomph, so to speak, <laughs> because it can be a long haul. Um, but in Philadelphia, for example, we just uh, celebrated maybe a month ago the opening of a new food co-op, Kensington Community Food Co-op, mm -hmm. um, after 10 years of that community organizing to get their food co-op. But it's here now. Okay, okay. Um, yes, I, I am, uh, and you know, I, I have the good fortune, you know, I mentioned this at a degrowth uh, speech uh, or sort of the talk that we did um, a couple of weekends back here, but I had the benefit of being a member of uh, maybe um, four of Chicago's uh, either formed, disappeared, or, you know, uh, or, or forming cooperatives, you know, so I, I was here in, uh, in 99. Um, and, you know, when I came in 99, we had the High Park Food Co-op, which, you know, made some unfortunate business decisions and had and ended up closing um, after 70 years, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, then, you know, we had, uh, we have now our, our Dill Pickle Co-op, which is kind of holding the fort down. We've got a forming Chicago market uh, co-op. Um, and then we've got a Rogers Park co-op, which I think, you know, is probably the oldest in formation at this point, because I think it's also in its sort of 10th year of, um, you know, building membership bases and, 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 and trying to establish itself. Um, and but, you know, all of those food cooperatives uh, are on the north side and sort of, you know, for mm -hmm. the geography of folks who may not be in Chicago, you know, that that represents generally, you know, when you say north side, it represents, you know, some white community or, or some some uh, perhaps just some non-black community rather. Um, you know, although there there are certainly, you know, pockets of, uh, of, of, of black communities that exist in those areas. Um, so, you know, is there any particular thing? I, I know that I have some some insights, you know, from having worked with the Healthy Food Hub. But you know, are there insights that you that you have drawn from maybe your relationship with some of these uh, forming food cooperative ventures that are unique to Black communities, and that are that are lessons that we should learn as we kind of think through and have communities who are thinking through? Certainly in Chicago, we've got the Austin community that's thinking through a food mm -hmm. cooperative, but you know, lessons that they should be drawing upon um, as they maybe move forward with that idea. Absolutely. Um, this is a particularly interesting time for uh, food co-op development in particular, as I think across the country in cities ranging from um, Detroit to Dayton, Ohio, to South L.A., Black folks are coming together to determine that they want control of um, their food economies and often are turning to the food co-op model as a way to meet um, needs for um, bringing food, more often than not healthy food, into their communities. I think one of the, the great lessons um, you know, to be applied and one of the great experiments that is also happening right now amongst these communities mm -hmm. is really in connecting um, um, with Black folks around cooperative e economics as a core strategy for really being able to garner their support for the grocery store, right? Mm -hmm. So in many ways, people come to co-ops thinking that it's something new. <laughs> per your introduction, you talked about this is something that we have done, that we, we have been doing, um, and that we actually do all the time to survive. So I think a lot of the effort is this balance between selling this dream or this, this vision of the grocery store and really also um, helping the community to embrace cooperative economics as a practice with the brick and mortar grocery store being an expression of that. Um, but that there can be many, many um, iterations of what an association of people can come together to do when they determine to meet their needs collectively. Absolutely. Um, so branching off there, um, the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, um, would you were, were you there from the sort of inception or just, you know, basically, I know you were on the board of directors originally. Mm -hmm. So so were you there for the founding or just after? Just about just about, um, you know, a group of folks in uh, the Philadelphia area who um, were parts of co-ops. They were board members, staffers, uh, consumer owners of different kinds of co-ops in the area. Um, There's actually a small group of them just had like a 
a conversation about what would it look like or what would it be like if we had an organization that supported the growth of the co-op economy in our city mm-hmm. and really, you know, look to galvanize and leverage um, the power within within the different uh, co-op sectors. So looking at consumer co-ops, worker co-ops, housing co-ops, um, looking at credit unions. And what if we all came together under the banner of co-ops and organized to move um, and grow a co-op economy? And that what emerged from that question was uh, PACA. And I was working at Mariposa Food Co-op um, when PACA, back in the fall of 2012, um, convened cooperators throughout the city of Philadelphia. About 70 of us got together to really start to have a conversation about the vision for what um, a PACA could be. They had done some work prior um, holding other kinds of events, but this was like a, the event that was setting the vision. And at that point, I was, you know, still rel- like less than six months into my role as the membership coordinator at Mariposa Food Co-op. And I kept saying to myself, I don't really know a lot about co-ops. <laughs> and I was supposed to like recruit people to join this co-op. So my thinking at the time was to just go ahead and start volunteering for PACA so that I could learn as much about cooperatives as as, as I could. Mm-hmm. And so um, at that point, we were just, you know, a group of volunteers acting as a steering committee to determine what this thing was going to be. Um, and, and that's how I got started. I served on the communications committee and when we determined that we wanted to go ahead and formalize as a nonprofit, I helped to write PACA's bylaws. Um, and then when it was time to, um, elect or to bring together, um, members, we, um, asked our founding members to, um, elect board members. And so that's one of the ways that PAC is actually a co-op of co-ops and that we are democratically governed by our member co-ops who um, nominate and elect our board members from their own memberships. Mm -hmm. And so I got elected to serve on um, PACA's board, I think in 2013 or 2014. And I've been a part of um, this organization since then and um, transitioned into the executive director role in February of 2017. So um, I'm 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 really interested in the the sort of uh, inception there uh, when you talk about the you know the the folks who were who were coming together were they 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 were already from different sectors of cooperatives or different types of cooperatives or were there were food cooperatives maybe overwhelmingly represented there or something like in in, in the group the the original core group yeah most of them. Um we probably had at least three uh, of our founding co-ops that were food co-ops, okay. uh, but the energy co-op was also a founding co-op. We had a credit union that was also a founding co-op. We had a housing co-op as a founding co-op. So there was diversity in that mix at that um, beginning stage as well, even though um, the food co-op certainly dominated in terms of the numbers. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. The only reason I'm, I'm really interested in that is because we've had these interesting iterations where we, we've had, we've got, of course, the, the sort of one established food co-op, but then we also have had the two forming co-ops. And at one point, you know, there was some legislation that was going to be beneficial to the, the, the food cooperatives. And so they formed a, a food cooperative alliance. Um, the legislation didn't go through the alliance just sort of mostly dissolved um and mm-hmm. then you know you get the energy now of the sort of worker cooperatives that are that's forming now we've got some legislation that's forming around that and there's a similar sort of you know a bit of bit of insularity you know a similar sort of um okay well we're focused on this this particular cooperative sector um so can you maybe speak to the power of of combining it and just kind of thinking through how all of those sectors um co- cooperate together Sure. I mean, I think, it. you know, Philadelphia is also um, fortunate in that we have a mature co-op ecosystem. We, you know, one of our oldest cooperatives here is, you know, a, a food co-op approaching uh, 80 years old and are just outside of um, Philadelphia in, in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. Um, but we also have 30 plus year old worker co-ops, um, child space, for example, um, and home care associates, as well as housing um, co-op with the Life Center um, Association that's also um, you know, over 25, 30 years old. So this maturity um, also kind of, I, I think a lot has allowed over the decades, our co-ops to 
be in relationship with each other before PACA came on the scene, okay. right? Um, and some of that happens because of the dream of the co-op Commonwealth, right? Like a neighborhood like West Philly has a cooperative preschool, a grocery store, credit unions, um, and housing co-ops. And their residents, for example, will be members of all of those, right? So they could show up to a meeting and be able to wear multiple hats, being able to speak to the needs of the different sectors. And so I think um, that that richness has really been um, a contributing factor to the ways in which the sectors have been been able to work together. Mm -hmm. And even over the course of um, of PAC is coming into being, uh, you alluded to the, the worker co-op sector really gaining traction over the last uh, couple of years in particular. And as such, you know, it's it's been a question for us. Like we have, you know, it's certainly um, top of mind for public officials and <laughs> thinking about cooperatives. <laughs> Um, and so in our work, really trying to motivate and move our member co-ops to to see this as an opportunity to grow the sector and to recall the purpose for cooperatives existing. Right. So that um, and principle six, cooperation amongst cooperatives. And I think PAC is an expression of that and that our members really value that. So our efforts to really be able to address the needs of our sectors individually, um, I think we've 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 gained traction in being able to do that with our um, our food co-ops for sure. We're gaining traction with doing that with our worker co-ops. Have been looking for opportunities to do that um, most recently with our child care and education co-ops in the area, um, and so are looking to do things that are specific to their sectors while simultaneously finding reason and finding opportunities to bring them all together. And they're still at the table, I think, because of the broader project. They believe in the broader project of growing the cooperative economy, that this is what um, our city, our region needs, and it's what we have had, and that we need to build that together in order for it to, to, to thrive. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll shift a bit to the um, the project that you know really got me deeply interested in, in PACA, um, you know, and, and just um, the the twenty twenty book clubs, twenty cooperatives. Um, so maybe just give uh, give give folks some background in terms of the the scope of that project and the the, out, the you know both the goals and the outcomes of that project, if you will, just in brief. Sure. Um, <clears throat> So I think it was um, maybe 2013, 2014, when Jessica Gordon Nemhart uh, came out with the book Collective Courage, which chronicles the history of African American um, um, cooperation, cooperative economics practices, mutual aid practices, and cooperative enterprise um, creation um, in, throughout our history here in the United States. And uh, at that time, Packer had a staff member who, you know, was reading the book, became familiar with this, with what was going on, and was inspired really to um, to envision, you know, what what could be done with it. Part of the history that Jessica um, talks about in the narrative is that amongst all of the co-ops that she researched, um, they all formed study circles before they opened and established their businesses, right? So people spent time together to learn about their industry and the sector that they wanted to identify what the need is that they wanted to fulfill. But they also spent time getting to know each other and figuring out how they were gonna work together, um, forming you know, democratic governance structures and, and really trying to imbue these cooperative principles in their and how they express themselves in their relationships. And so, um, a staff, staff member was Caitlin Quigley and, and she proposed this idea of like, well, let's bring back the study circles. And Philadelphia actually had a history of having study circles here in the in um, the 1940s um, in particular. And, you know, we had the opportunity to submit a grant to the uh, for the Night Cities Challenge and was awarded the grant to do um, the 20 book clubs, 20 cooperative businesses program which allowed PACA to work with about um, almost 200 people from across the city of Philadelphia and some folks out in Chester, PA as well. Um, majority black and brown folks, majority folks from poor and working class backgrounds, um, working in individual groups to think about a business that they might wanna create and to take the time to study how the co-op business model might be applicable um, to that, that idea that they have. And after six months of study, some of the groups um, determined that 
okay, no, that's not what we want to do. Um, and some of them said, maybe we should study some more before committing to um, launching a business together. And about half of the groups actually determined that they did want to start cooperatives. And so we were able to also offer those groups um, kind of like a co-op or business strategy, kind of like boot camp on getting some business strategy basics, like how do you budget? How do you identify your target um, market? Um, you know, these core kinds of competencies about organizing and creating a business that you're going to need throughout the life cycle of your your enterprise and helping people cultivate those skills. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was going on in 2016, 2017. And, you know, with by 2018, we in early into this year, we saw the creation of seven new cooperative businesses come out of that project. Um, and so this combination of, of study, um, and, you know, providing um, business uh, education and then continuing to provide technical assistance and some handholding with those groups and connecting them with um, other technical assistance and professional um, services providers really has helped us to grow um, the number of cooperatives in our area. And, and then, and so in terms of... Um I'll lead, I'll lead with the sort of providers. So in terms of thinking about how to cultivate, you know, um, and, and so this gets to that, that cultivation of a cooperative infrastructure, um, you know, you, you've mentioned that you have some of that there, um, but then you have to bring in these sort of other providers to provide sort of technical assistance services. What's the sort of educational process that comes there? You know, where are, are, is there a sort of extensive amount that you're having to teach some of these providers about working with cooperatives specifically? as you as you bring them as you connect them in um it's a it, it's it's mixed kind of bag um we we've had some uh technical some some partners um that have come like they've had some kind of familiarity with co-ops even if uh they haven't had clients who were co-ops they might be members of a co-op or or have been a member of a co-op previously uh, so one of the things that we've done is we've worked to create what we call a community of practice, who are these um, technical assistance providers, funders, um, you know, lawyers, accountants, who have these technical skills and an interest in cooperatives. We've done, um, you know, workshops with some of those um, community um a practice partners to kind of give them more in-depth kind of information about cooperatives. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we do um, is we, when we have a startup that we're referring to um, that partner, we stay in the relationship with them so that um, the technical um, person is helping them. For example, it could be a lawyer. Uh, when our when a lawyer that we're working with now was uh, interested in, in doing lots of complex uh, deals with LLCs, right? LLCs that had complicated ownership structures. And another one of our um, partners knew this lawyer and was like, hey, you should check out co-ops because if you're really challenged by, you know, this kind of structure, check out the co-op structure. And so he was interested. And so by in order to kind of help him get up to speed, you know, we, we were there with him. So it was like, sure, this group needs a draft of operating agreements, but you can't tell them, you know, not to do X, Y, or Z, because if they don't do that, that no longer allows them to be a co-op. Like we have to have space for like democratic governance, for example, and how the operating agreement is, is written. So yes, it's harder or maybe more work, but we need you to leave that in there. And here is why. So over time, working with him to kind of like help him gain his co-op knowledge, um, referring him to educational resources from partner institutions, and he's taken to it, right? So he's doing some of the study on his own. We stay in communication with him and with the co-op group that we've referred and therefore are able to really help move the, um, the process forward with the, the co-op staying intact and everybody learning a, along the same way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so um, uh, I'll take a, a bit of a tangent on the sort of funding, um, funding question. So 
one of the things that that Co-op for Lib was uh, recently engaged in. So we 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 had an opportunity to uh, pursue some funding um, that that would assist you know us with kind of just moving our operations along, and. Um, we, we ran into sort of a values question. We, we wanted to make sure that, uh, one, you know, we had a, a rubric for evaluating the values of folks that, that um, we are uh, obtaining funding from, but then just a, a values for sort of, you know, um, a values for, what, for why funding comes in, how funding is used, how funding is governed. And all of that sent us into, it was a wonderful discussion that actually uh, deepened our cooperative learning. So, um, what are some of the ways that, that you evaluate maybe relationships with, um, with funding and with foundations? Um, so certainly, you know, they have particular outcomes that they're pursuing. Um, and, and how do you sort of uh, make, this, make the evaluation around how you all move forward with that uh, in, at, at PACA? Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, gosh, so we've been doing this organizing work since about 2012. I think our first grants probably started coming in around um, 2014, 2015. So we're still a startup in many ways, too. Um, we've been fortunate in that we've been able to have a, a few uh, larger grants to sustain our work, which isn't necessarily um, ideal in the sense that we could do better at diversifying our funding stream. Um, but it has also meant that, you know, we, we've had a lot of learning of, along the way. So, for example, um, one of the things that became really important to um, me when I first came in as the executive director for PACA was, um, you know, we had a vision statement, we had a mission statement, we had a statement about um, racial and economic equity, but we didn't actually have value statement, mm -hmm. right? So we understood that we adhered to the cooperative, the international um, cooperative principles, but we also didn't find that they were deep, they took our work deep enough or that were specific enough to some of the challenges and opportunities that we were um, were presented to us. For example, around funding, you know, if an organization doesn't have a clear set of guiding values and principles, um, the opportunity to take funding from lots of different places is on the table. So we spent probably the first year or so um, while I, of my being an executive director position, working with our board to carve out what these values are, were going to be for us. And as we got clearer about that, I think we've been able to now use that as the rubric <laughs> for what we will and won't do. Right. And so um, that hasn't always been the case. And it's an exercise and it's a practice. And it's also like something that we have to constantly like contend with. Right. As our board changes and new members come on, there's an education process for them as well to like say like, hey, this is this is who we are. Right. And this is this is um, who we want to be. Can you are you down with that? <laughs> right. Because this is the direction that we're trying to go in. Um, so it's a um, we, we've been fortunate to not have too many challenges in that way. Um, but I think it's critical that we determined what we were going to use um, to make those decisions. It's certainly, you know, and it's it's a hard call. You know, I'm like having been on the board side and seeing things one way and then seeing things on the executive director side, I see things from different perspectives now. And there's a lot of, you know, I think in many ways things can seem very black and white before you're confronted with the nuance of certain kinds of decision making. And in the ED role, I've come up across that where I'm like, well, <laughs> You know, I might not be able to, I, I might have to compromise on this so that our work can actually happen. Mm -hmm. Because if I don't, our work doesn't happen, period. Yeah. So, um, so there, those are, that's also part of, you know, the challenge of being in the nonprofit industrial complex, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is that it, we're set up to have to choose sometimes um, between impossible choices. Mm hmm and so I, I know that when I look at uh, something like um, there's a, a document out of the, the European Union, you know, that's um, 
like social economy volume for or something like that. Um, and when it was essentially the European Union uh, d having a commission go through and evaluate the sort of landscape of the social economy in Europe. And, um, you know, the, the way that, that you see sort of things structured in Europe, I mean, certainly they have lots more advanced legislation, you know, that, that kind of supports not only cooperatives, but, you know, um, things like, uh, like non-monetary trading and, and, and various things. So I, I know that you, you, um, you know, you, you'd spoken at, at one point around the sort of diversifying funding and thinking about uh, the restructuring of how how PACA is set up, you know, uh, and, and how sort of membership is engaged. Is there uh, one, you know, I mean, anything that that's sort of not 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 still baking, you know, that you can kind of share around how you're thinking about diversifying funding and 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 maybe may, maybe it looks like more of an association later on. Maybe it's not like a nonprofit, but maybe it's sort of a membership association. In, in my understanding, that direction correctly. Yeah, I mean, I think I I can remember being at um, as a steering committee member for PACA and some of the early conversations that we had were about we want to be sustained by our members. Mm -hmm. um, and that that would be the goal, right? That our mem we would be accountable to our member co-ops and they will fund our work. Um, the reality of that is shaping up to present itself uh, to, to, to show us like that's a really ambitious goal, right? Because you have to think about um, how many cooperatives would we need mm -hmm. um, at, you know, providing annual dual dues at what level? Mm -hmm. um, what scope and scale of programming are we trying to offer that then would meet or match up with the resources available to our member co-ops? We are pretty far away from being a member funded organization if we take those those things into consideration mm -hmm. in that we have we're an organization that has paid staff that, mm -hmm. you know, we're about a quarter of a million dollar budget organization. Most of that is grant funded. And in order for us to imagine a different structure, we really have to create a different economy, <laughs> right? So <laughs> right. we have to create new cooperatives and, you know, we can, we can create startups over and over and over again, right? But each of them are paying $250 a year and a startup's five, six, seven years. We, we have a long way to go mm -hmm. before we see our sector as being funded by our sector. Right. I think another opportunity, however, um, that we do have and, and something that is a question for us is really thinking about how do we leverage the participation of the members of our cooperatives. And so, for example, you know, PACA has, I think, 25 uh, co-op members currently, which represent tens of thousands of people who live in and around Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. We don't have direct access, <laughs> right, to those tens of thousands of people. So one of the things that we're working towards this year and going into next year is, is really working um, and, and being in communication with our members around this, this, this question of organizing the individual members within our cooperative ecosystem, right? So that, you know, there's opportunity for them to be thinking about how they want to support and grow um, the cooperative economy because they've already they're already here <laughs> in doing that work to be thinking about how to leverage um, you know their existing buy-in and thinking about advocacy and policy opportunities um, that can or could be existed for our um, our local co-op economy um, to be thinking about how to leverage the talents and skills <laughs> within that community so that they're able to also contribute to supporting the development of cooperatives, right? Yes. So we're, this is, you know, our board is really starting to kind of think about these questions around, you know, we have a couple of contacts that we speak with on a regular basis within each of our um, co-op members. But each of those co-ops might have five or six or seven um, co-op members or 10,000 households, <laughs> right? So there's an entire, an, an entire population of folks that we are not connected with who are the low hanging fruit. So in some ways we're kind of imagining how can we tap into, um, 
the existing interest, the existing commitment, um, and, and really leverage connecting with people, right? To make this about movement building with people and not, um, not solely emphasizing the enterprise, right? But remembering the association of people and calling on the power of the association of people to help us do this work. Hmm. All right. And so there you get to the fifth uh, value of time banking, which is social networks matter. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, yes. And, and so uh, with that, I just want to take a brief pause to uh, let folks know um, that uh, Co-op for Lib, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group, uh, will be coming up uh, this Sunday. Uh, we are at the Breathing Room, 1434 West 51st Street from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, this week is our values discussion. Uh, we did our values primer last week. And effectively, uh, uh, as, uh, as Jamila talked about, you know, um, we, are t we are thinking through uh, and strategizing uh, what are the values of Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group as we move forward um, to think through how cooperation the strategies are implemented in black communities, and then also as we think about how we partner to uh, establish some of those structures. Um, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group uh, has been meeting for a year at this point. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we, we are moving forward with this process of de developing the cooperative curriculum that we're going to be learning from uh, over the, the next uh, several months. Uh, so it, it would be behoove you to go ahead and uh, join us there on Sunday. Um, and then on June 30th, um, we will be having our worker cooperative uh, uh, curriculum intro. Uh, so we'll, we'll be uh, talking through and previewing some of the curriculum that we'll be going to uh, going through over the next several months. And we look forward to having you join us. Um, so with that, um, ooh, pardon me, I've knocked off the Skype. I just want to put that <laughs> back. Boom. Um, so what are some of the things that uh, that Paca's currently, you know, what's 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 the hot topic or the hot project that uh, that Paca's currently working on? Um, she is. <laughs> well, <laughs> we are um, wrapping up our first year of um, contracted funding with the city of Philadelphia mm -hmm. um, in which we were able to um, do a few different things. Um, one, it was to provide direct technical ex assistance to existing um, startup co-ops. Mm -hmm. um, two was to um, to work on this conversions piece, right? Um, and what what kind of made this work uh, get sidetracked, but also maybe even just envisioned differently from from how we thought it was going to happen was that the city of Philadelphia was um, chosen to be among four cities in the U.S. Um, to participate in the Shared um, Equitable Economic Development Fellowship um, put together by the National League of Cities and the Democracy at Work Institute. And PACA was invited to be um, the community fellow for, for that engagement. Mm -hmm. And so we've been really trying to think about what is it, what what kind of ecosystem building, um, what kind of internal um, knowledge building needs to happen within um, the city, within its partner organizations to support um, employee ownership and worker cooperative development um, more explicitly in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and then to really be thinking about how do we leverage um, opportunities to preserve existing businesses through converting them to worker owned um, cooperatives, right? So we have a lot of um, um, elders thinking about retiring mm -hmm. and what's the opportunity, you know, what's gonna happen to those businesses? And so the city is really like interested in this question of preserving legacy businesses, particularly minority owned um, businesses. And so we're, we're kind of like trying to have this conversation and, and figuring out, for example, in the city of Philadelphia, we have um, probably close to 300 business corridors um, throughout the city. And, you know, they each, many of them have um, CDCs and uh, 
corridor managers attached to them. So those corridor managers have relationships with the business owners, right? So PACA doesn't have to go out onto 52nd Street necessarily to go and try to survey and talk to all of the business owners up and down, you know, the 52nd Street corridor, which is a historically African-American um, uh, neighborhood and business district, but they have a, 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 a corridor manager there, right? So what would it take for us to be able to get the corridor managers to talk to their business, to their business owners about employee ownership, right? So we've been building out a corridor manager training, right? And with support from the Democracy at Work Institute, um, our commerce department and support from um, council member Derek Green's office here. And so thinking about this idea of simultaneously needing to both build up our infrastructure Right, so that we have the professionals, the funding, and the knowledge base established so that as people are interested in learning more about cooperatives or determine that they want their businesses to become cooperatives, we have the people and resources in place to send them there, right? But we have to do the work simultaneously, okay. and that's challenging, but we're working on it. Um, I think the last piece that we're, we're currently um, the two pieces they'll say, one is we just wrapped up um, a three-part cooperative economics um, study circle that we did for black communities um, that was kind of really rooted in what we did with the 20 book clubs, 20 cooperative businesses program, and really just like being able to reconnect black folks to uh, our history of cooperative economics, um, but also to really be able to debunk the myth, the myth that black people don't do co-ops, right? <laughs> By examining where in the country, where where are black people showing up to do this work? And we know that those examples exist. So we use some of the time in that study circle to examine that. And um, we're currently working with some of those participants with a couple of organizations to imagine how do we keep that study kind of moving forward. Um, and then lastly, we are working on doing um, leadership development workshops and training um, for democratically organized businesses and cooperatives. I think, you know, the education work that needs to happen within cooperatives, like while they exist, when they're starting up, like building a learning culture within our businesses is so important, right? Mm -hmm. And so being able to really connect people with the skills both the technical skills around like, you know, finances, but also, you know, organizational development skills like systems and design thinking, right? So we're wanting to be um, a space where people can really be able to, to imagine creating full throttle businesses that, you know, aren't solely based on, on people's values and their ideologies, but they can actually function and be profitable and sustainable businesses. So we're trying to make sure that um, you know, PAC is a small organization. We can't do all of the things, but where we have the skills and the expertise is certainly around really supporting people to be able to strengthen their associations of people, to understand and to figure out how do we practice this democracy thing within our cooperatives, right? And to really connect to our um, our partners who have those technical skills and bring people together to um, to gain that knowledge together. Magnificent, magnificent. Um, yes, and, and so uh, I hope that, you know, uh, from that discussion, you all are, are plugging in and learning already. Um, I hope that you all are already on the PACA website. Can you go ahead and give the PACA website for us, Jamila? Sure. We are at www.philadelphia.coop. That's just C O O P, philadelphia.coop. Absolutely. So I hope you're already on the PACA website. Um, I hope you're looking at the resources that they have there. I hope you're, you know, you're going to the YouTube video and looking at Capitalish. You know, <laughs> uh, yes. I, I hope that you are really plugging in um, because there's some dynamite work that is happening uh, at the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, and uh, there's some some wonderful, uh, excellent examples and stories and, and and learnings that are coming from Jamila's work. And uh, I want to go ahead and thank you. We are at eight forty. So, you know, I, I want to make sure that I get uh, an opportunity both, you know, to um, get to the closing. But I want to thank you for your contribution and for, for the opportunity to interview this evening. Um, are there any capstone words that you want to leave us with at all? Um, well, much appreciation. Thank you, Mike, so much for um, having me on to talk about this work. I 
am so grateful for the work that y'all are doing. I think when we first met, I, you know, you were like, what are you doing? And now I keep going back to your <laughs> website and to your Facebook page wondering, like, what's Cola Nut up to? So I'm so excited to see um, the growth and, and what all is, is coming out of the work that y'all are doing in Chicago. Um, and I just want to say, you know, I want to lift up the association of people. When we determine that we want to do stuff together, we can do it. We can make the world that we want. We can create the economies that we want. And there's all kinds of tools already existing and being innovative for us to do this work together. So let's go. Boom. Yes. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll drop on top of that, you know, something that I always utter from Movement Generation, and this is just a paraphrase. Uh, we don't need economists to tell us, you know, about how to build the economy. We live the economy every day. Uh, so let's go out there and make the economy we want. Uh, thank you again, Jamila. I'm going to go ahead and disconnect and give a few final words, but I appreciate your, your time this evening. All right. Thank you. All right. Ooh. All right, folks, um, that concludes uh, the Ujima Awa. Um, I hope that you've uh, learned uh, a, a great amount from uh, the, the conversation with Jamila. Um, as you can see, I still have not mastered lighting, you know, here in this uh, this this space. Um, so the, the goal for next year, the goal for 2020 is that the Ujima Awa moves into a studio. Um, I'm going to just call that out. I have no idea what, you know, I, I, how I'm going to make that happen. I, I've probably got some connections that I'm not maximizing. So there, social networks matter. Um, Ujima Awa moves into a studio um, because I want to make sure that I have these conversations in full Technicolor or, or whatever you know we're using now in full HD um, and I want to make sure that every bit of this conversation comes to you without interruption without disruption from my technical glitches um, that is three episodes deep that I've had them but that's okay uh, we live on um, and we thrive on uh, because we have the skills and we have the capacity to overcome technical glitches. <laughs> um, with that, the Ujima Awa is uh, coming to you um, every second Monday of the month. Uh, so our next session, um, we'll be talking to Dion Lucas um, of E.G. Wood. And if you're not familiar with E.G. Wood, E.G. Wood is in the Inglewood community of Chicago, and E.G. Wood is working on uh, cooperatively owned real estate. Uh, so, so they're they're working through thinking through thinking how uh, entrepreneurs can cooperatively own a share of real estate and operate their businesses out of that space. So we'll have uh, a more engagement um, on July 8th uh, with. Um, Dion Lucas of E.G. Wood. Um, so I expect to see you all back here on July 8th uh, as we talk to Dion. Um, and until then, um, build cooperation, uh, appreciate all forms of capital, uh, cultivate the economy that you want to see, uh, cooperative and solidarity and otherwise, uh, and let's build the autonomy of our communities, right? Ultimately, all of this work, all of what we're trying to do in terms of cultivating a more cooperative economy is towards uh, a liberatory practice for our communities. It's, it's towards building the autonomy of our communities. Um, and, and something that I did not get to speak to tonight, you know, um, was the, the work that's happening within the South Deering Manor Community Association. Um, because there are conversations that this community is thinking about uh, around how it's able to assert its control over the sort of local land. And there are ways that we can enter into that conversation, into that context on on a very on a, on a micro level on a very local level um, inside of our neighborhoods and inside of our communities and we can bring these principles down there with us as well even as we are attempting to enact these principles in the ways that we engage with food land and housing uh, and our workplace so the Ujima Awa uh, thanks you for, for this evening and I will see you on the next one July 8th Dion Lucas good night and good evening <laughs>